gents, we're going to get this show on the road. Um, for those of you I haven't met yet, my name is Mark Edwards. I'm chair of the committee of the Melbourne section. Um, I'm very pleased to again welcome Dr. Graham Huon, who is going to give us episode two of Vector Wavefront with some, hopefully, some demos as well, which is what I've been looking forward to. So, without any further ado, Graham. Thanks, mate. Well, good evening. Uh, I was here, uh, and I discovered it was in June 2010, which seems like it was about six months ago, but it wasn't, uh, talking about these, the various formats that would possibly extend on from stereo and surround. And uh, there are two. So tonight, there are some new faces here, and I knew there would be, so it's probably worthwhile for me to go back over, very, very briefly go back over what I did before, so you've got some context, and then I'll go on with uh, some demonstrations, and you can experience, hopefully, you can experience something that doesn't restrict you to the sweet spot and doesn't restrict the listening areas and so on. So I hope tonight that you save up lots of questions and have an interesting experience. Please don't walk into each other when you're walking around. That, that can be a bit suboptimal. But anyway, what I'll do is I'll go through very briefly to start with, I'll cover the stereo and surround, where it came from, what the key elements of that are, uh, then go on to what I'm calling the wave formats and I'll be describing two different formats in that area. And then third, as I said, the vector wave front or VWF demonstrations. The first thing is that in 1931, stereo emerged from the uh, monophonic sound reproduction that we had, primarily for the cinema. Some 40 years later, the next development was uh, for the cinema again, for the surround systems where people wanted experiences going past them and they still wanted to have some sense of space and immers immersive experience in the cinema. So we go on 40 years again, uh, where are we? What choices have we got? We've gone digital, but we went digital about 40 years ago, roughly. Um, what choices have we got? Well, we've really got three. We can investigate the number of samples we take per second. And at the moment, we've got uh, sample rates extending well above what you need for human audible listening. Um, we can increase the word size and therefore increase the resolution of each bit at the moment we've got dynamic ranges in excess of 140 dB and that's in excess of what humans can cope with so I'm not too sure whether we should expend our bit budget on that. Uh, what else is left? Well, one thing you can do is add more channels and if you're really daring you could probably look at a completely new format but that could be a really big challenge because how the hell do you step away from, from stereo and surround? Number of channels, I'll talk about that just for a minute. We, well I was a lesser player, but Tomlinson Holman, who is uh, quite well respected in America for surround sound and cinema, uh, and I did demonstrations about 11 years ago on the first of the 10.2 formats or the higher order formats. These are not just 10 speakers, these are 10 discrete channels. So you're looking at capturing, editing, storing, forwarding, rendering and reproducing discrete channels. So in the slide it says 14 and the reason for that is we had two low frequency channels for stereo bass, we had 10 channels of surround and we had the options of dipoles or direct radiators for the surround. So if you get out your fingers and toes you'll find that's 14. What was new about 10.2 was it was the first format to introduce height channels. Prior to that, everything was in the round but in the plane. And today, most of the sound reproduction is in the round and in the plane. It is the 5.1 stereo, etc. No height information there. 
where do we go from there with number of channels? Anybody have domestic issues with 10 amplifiers and 10 loudspeakers at home? All right, well the Japanese don't because they've gone to 22.2. So they've got 24 discrete channels and they do that primarily for cinema. Uh, stereo bass again, there you go. And three layers. So there's a top layer, a middle layer, which would be closest to 10 channel that we did, and then a low layer, which they try and do below you, 22.2. Uh, that, I think, is the world record holder at the moment. Would you like to put 22 channels in? 22 amplifiers? 22 power bills? 22? No, probably not. So, so what are we going to do? Let's think about what the essence of stereo and surround is. All of the formats to date have been meticulously designed to deliver what the director intended to one location in the room, which we have dubbed the sweet spot. If you look at the stereo formats, we have two loudspeakers, not really a sweet spot, a sweet line but we have two loudspeakers and a constrained listening environment. If you move off that listening environment, of course you still hear sound, but it's not creating the imagery that the director intended. If you go way offline, you'll get proximity issues and you'll really only be listening to one loudspeaker or the other. We add more channels. There's your standard ITU 775, five channels. 90 to 120 degrees plus the LCRs at 60 degrees and in the centre on equal radius. All of the standards for surround were equal radius formats. What happened with 10.2 was let's fix a few of the problems. Big gaps on surround imagery, no hard rear centre, so wandering images and no height. So. In comes 10.2, fills a couple of gaps, gives you a hard rear and gives you two high channels. Done on the basis of Tom's work on what was the most effective uh, bang for your buck with new speakers. There have been some other format uh, evolutions. One of them was to look at the transfer function of the human head and emulate that in the, in the function that you were delivering from your speakers. The advantage of that is you're able to place sound images in different directions. So you can have a loudspeaker somewhere, process the sound according to what the head should be hearing, and the head is tricked into thinking that that sound is somewhere else. And that is uh, Dolby headphones, which was Lake prior. Uh, quite a few uh, people, companies working on creating that. Big advantages for it. One of them is it can be delivered over stereo. Uh, so you can actually deliver over the existing formats and create what are effectively phantom channels. But what I would say about that is it's very rigorously a forward facing uh, format. A and in fact, if you're wearing headphones listening to it, <laughs> it, it, it's moving with you. So you have the problem of trying to match that imagery you're hearing to an image on a screen, for example, because when you turn, the screen didn't move. But still looking at what is effectively a sweet spot or sweet region. There's been work on ambisonics, quite a lot of work done on ambisonics. Ambisonics had capture mechanisms that could capture sound from all directions and transmit those sounds, but was always having to deliver through existing formats of loudspeakers. So again, it had restrictions, not of its own doing, but it had restrictions relating to the fixed forward perspective and the sweet spot. Do you all understand what I mean, what I mean by fixed forward perspective? I've got one nod, a couple of nods, maybe I should explain it. You, the imagery you're seeing is presented by the director so that you are seeing the scene in front of you if you move or turn, that stops working. <coughs> okay. There have been some other ones and called by various names. Ambiophonics was one name that was given to crosstalk cancelling strategies for sound reproduction, where you take 
uh, a speaker and try and get it to deliver sound only to one ear. The trouble with that is that the other ear is getting spill from that loudspeaker and that will be detracting from the purity of the image that that ear was getting. So, uh, you can put the correct filtering functions in to minimise the amount of spill that is getting around to the other ear. And you do that twice and you, what you've done is effectively <coughs> expanded your uh, format to give you a much wider sound stage and improved headphone-like, no, improved uh, reproduction. Again, it's obviously going to have a fixed forward perspective and it's going to be recorded and delivered so that it is delivering to a sweet spot. The common factor is all of those systems assumed, assumed there was one location where it all worked. And that was the sweet spot. So is there an alternative to this? Those that were here 18 months ago will say, we're not sure. <laughs> and those that weren't will probably say, I'm not sure either. Uh, yes, there is an alternative. If you think of sound sources anywhere, in a room, in the wild, in a paddock, don't care, waves come out of each of those devices and come towards your listening position. When those waves arrive, that is what you hear. You think you hear the source, but you don't. You hear the arriving waves. So if we stopped concentrating on reproducing sound sources, you know, the drum and the violin or the voice, and concentrated on reproducing the wave front that they were creating, then we may be able to change the situation so that it was as if you were in that room or in that paddock or in that location. So you should then be able to do what you did in that environment and move or turn and still have placed imagery. Shift from reproducing sources to reproducing the wave fronts. Two aspects of that are important. One of them is direction. You're going to have to reproduce wave fronts that contain information on direction. And when you get out your ruler and your, your compass, you find that that's the normal to the wave front or the, or the perpendicular to the wave front. But the other point that is often missed is if you're going to do that, you're going to have to preserve distance information because as the wave travels, it spreads out and changes its curvature. Here is a trumpet and the wave is wave front is propagated out a certain distance. If we now move that trumpet to a new location, given that the listener's over there, if we move that trumpet to a new location and then just look at the wave front, because remember we've shifted from the sound source to looking at the wave front. Just look at the wave front. What do you see? You see the normal direction of the sources, and I picked them to be in the same direction, but you also see that the wavefront has diverged and is now less curved. You can probably imagine that if I was reproducing a source a very long way away, that wavefront would tend to be planar. The information in the curvature of that wavefront contains what you need for distance. So when you concentrate on the wavefront, what you've got to do is preserve direction and distance information. Make sense? I hope so. If you could do this, if you could actually recreate the wave field, let's not worry about how or whether you can. If you could, what would happen is you'd create acoustics waves the same as in real life. Your body is a very well calibrated instrument that can determine the location of something even when you're turning and moving was probably a very good idea years ago when you're trying to survive. Uh, recreating the wavefront just lets you do that. Just lets you do what your body does naturally. Track sources. It means that you can now have different perspectives. If you turn, you now have a different perspective, a new 
map of where those objects are, but it's still consistent with where those sources were. It makes sense to your brain. It means that more than one person can have the same listening experience and have a slightly different view of it. If you're over there, in the cheap seats, you'd probably find that you're getting quite a good perspective of things that are over near you, and probably not as good as over here. If you're in the centre, you're probably getting a very good balanced perspective, but not just of equal distance sources, but of all the things that are around you everywhere. But a key point about this is, suddenly we're going to have to divorce the wave fronts from the loudspeakers that are creating them. Because if you're over there and listening and getting a, a result, a sound, and are getting a consistent sound when you move across to the other side of the room, it is not going to be possible to do that if that is where the source is coming from. You're going to have to have the image correctly placed in space at a distance in a direction in order for all of that to work. So, the key to recreating waves is first to be able to synthesise controlled curvature wavefronts. You have to do that for each source, but that's okay because superposition will work, so you can put them all together and send them out. You have to do it for all the frequencies that that, that source could possibly have. And you've got to make it so that it works everywhere in the listening environment. Bit of a challenge? Another thing you need to do is to make it compatible. I mean, you, you can't just walk in with a new format. Well, actually, <laughs> some people have. But you really need to make something that's compatible with all the stuff that's there because nobody's interested in throwing away their legacy. No one. We've got millions of tonnes of beautiful stuff that's got to be able to work with this. If you did con synthesise controlled curvature wave fronts, they would automatically be compatible because all you needed to do was to set the same distance for all of the sources. Given that you had the ability to reproduce things in their correct locations in space, I'm not sure why you'd do that, but it means that these systems should intrinsically be compatible with your existing formats and your existing material. How can you do it? shouldn't ask you guys because I told you. There are two approaches to this and they were developed on opposite sides of the world at around about the same time. The second of those in 2002 was done by the Fraunhofer Institute. You know the Fraunhofer guys, they did the MPEG encoding and the MP3 and all that. Well they developed a system that they call wave field synthesis and I'm going to explain what that is very quickly. Uh, and that enabled them to create wave fronts with controlled curvature and, and intensity, by the way, intensity and curvature. But intensity is easy, isn't it? And the second one was in, invented as far away from Germany as you could get uh, here in Melbourne. And that was what we did, which was a different approach. And that was end fire arrays, which you're seeing tonight, uh, as distinct from the Fraunhofer broad fire arrays. How Fraunhofer works? Well, Huygens said that a wave front can be broken down or synthesised from a series of sources placed on the wave front. So any curvature or behaviour of a wave front can be recreated by placing enough sources in and then controlling the signals they're generating so that it creates the correct curvature. So what wave field synthesis does is it sends process signals to all loudspeakers and thereby recreates the wave front curvature and intensity for direction. There are some issues with this. First is the wave field synthesis approach needs a loudspeaker central to every possible source direction. They use over 200 loudspeakers in the room to make sure they've covered those with the appropriate attempt at spatial aliasing minimisation. So 200, and that gives you a 2D slice. We haven't got 3D out of that. But each one of those speakers needs its own process signal. 
So each one will need its own amplifier. So you need 200 amplifiers. And you'll need to wire them and put them somewhere. You can see them there. That's one wall. Uh, so there are some issues with that. Uh, because the arrays aren't infinitely closely spaced and infinite in extent, you do have issues with artefacts and truncation in the implementation and you've got to do some extra work to control that. You need a pretty grunty central DSP because it's got to simultaneously handle full bandwidth, 192 kilo samples per second times 200 channels. Uh, and that's, that's a pretty meaty sort of processor. Uh, but the big advantage is that you can use standard loudspeakers because you can correct for what the way the loudspeakers are behaving inside the processing of the digital processing you're doing. Uh, there is no logical or obvious matching capture approach to that. I can't imagine surrounding a sound source with 250 microphones and having a, a capture facility and a DSP, but maybe they've done it, I don't know. Uh, okay. Then we go to the other side of the world. What did we do? Well, we said we can synthesise wavefronts by adding controlled amounts of amplitude and phase in direction. And the way we could do that was to take an, an N-fire array, and do you know what I mean by N-fire? One source here, one source here, towards you, like this. Um, if we adjust the signals we're feeding to these two loudspeakers, we can create a wave front that propagates out from the front of this array. All bits are off in the middle of the array, by the way. But you can propagate out from the front of the array with a curvature tighter than a source at that position would be. What does tighter curvature mean? Closer. So we can create sound sources that are closer to you than the nearest array. Okay. Alternately, what we can do is add appropriate signal processing to create a planar or flat array. What does that mean? What's a, what, if a flat planar array arrives at you, what does it mean? It means the source is way, 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 way back there. Well behind this array. Well behind. Okay. It's not, it, it is not possible <laughs> to cover 360 degrees with a planar wave. I don't even suggest you try. So there'll be a limited field of view for each one of these arrays. And you'll go outside that, when you go outside that field of view, you'll start to get the images coming forward towards you. It happens that you can get low order reproduction using this system without needing DSP. However, if you want higher order or if you want to truncate or collapse the array into, say, one box, you're going to need to do some DSP processing. So it sounds great. Why haven't we all done this? There is an issue. The issue is, if you're going to use, in this case, two loudspeaker sources, arrays, to cover this whole room, people are not going to be in front of them. If they move across the room, you do not want to change the spectral energy that they're listening to. And in fact, you don't want to change the amplitude and phase of that spectral energy. So what you're going to need to do is make far, far better loudspeakers with accurate amplitude and phase both on and off axis. You can fix that problem by saying, well, we'll use more. So the, the challenge is, can you make a loudspeaker that has controlled directivity so that the amplitude and phase maintains itself on axis and off axis? Right, so a little challenge for you. The problem with the systems that we have today, that has not been looked at. That doesn't need to be looked at. It's not a black mark, it doesn't need to be looked at because the people designing loudspeakers for sweet spots aimed them. There was one place where it worked. Now we've got this additional challenge. These are 
first generation loudspeakers and they use diffractive wave plates to control amplitude and phase with direction. I'll be interested in your comments today. Uh, they provide a much wider broadband point source behaviour, but not ideal. We're now on our second generation of those and they have a much better controlled amplitude and phase with direction. The high frequency units now have a 3 dB corner relative to one axis at 80 degrees off axis, which is about there, at 25 kilohertz. So they're much better as omni point sources. What would that mean if you used them for stereo? Hell, a lot more spectral energy going into the room, but much better phase coherence. So much, you'd expect much better imaging. See if you hear it tonight. Okay. Peter said, <laughs> Peter, Peter said that I should give you a progress report <coughs> on the hapless inventor. We, we here are an R&D organisation. We are presently engaging in licensed product development. The licensed product development is loudspeakers, but it's also microphones. Because no microphones today are available that actually capture distance information. They don't catch the divergence or the, or the wavefront gradient formally. Some of them do do it, but it's not part of their design. Loudspeakers I talked about, also encoders, decoders and compression systems. The standard compression systems that applied to the sweet spot have masking algorithms for a forward centre image. Once the image is no longer forward and centre, all bets are off for those compression algorithms. So if anybody here would like a job in DSP, loudspeaker design, microphone design, distribution, broadcast, capture, there's an opportunity here. A lot of stuff is going to be needed. May go nowhere. <laughs> okay, now we go on to the demonstrations. Uh, I've got to do a bit of a talk about what we're doing here because you're looking at it and saying what the hell is it. Um, what we're going to do is look at some of the VWF claims. For instance, acoustic imaging insensitive to listener location. Um, whether it works in real rooms with real air conditioning. Uh, whether it's giving you a better chance of understanding complex sound fields and picking out items in those sound fields than stereo does, whether it's compatible with stereo. There are a number of formats for this, and I think, I, did I cover formats last time? Did, ooh, there's lots of formats, uh, okay. Okay, well, uh, there, are th there are three formats. Uh, one of them is where a, you're looking in a window at a series of sound images that are correctly placed. So sources are all correct in space, but you're looking through a portal or a window, and I call that the voyeur format. You're not in the sound field, you're observing it, but it is consistent. So everything's at the right distance, in the right direction. And when you move in front of that portal, it all stays consistent, but you're not in it. The second one is the inverse of that, where you're in the field. The field's all around you, the acoustic horizon vanishes in every direction, uh, and you are inside that field. So sound objects are everywhere, but you can't walk out of that field. Even although you're hearing sounds at the vanishing point in distance, you cannot go past the array generating it. That is usually the boundary of the room, so that's okay. It's very hard to go through the wall of a room, but the sound images do. The third one is, is really the meeting of those two, and it's what I call bubble. So it's a format where you've placed the reproduction apparatus in a region and are recreating sound fields so that it's correct all around that and you can walk right around it and still have consistent sound fields. What is interesting with that is no matter where you stand relative to that source the vanishing points at minus infinity so your sound objects appear to be well behind that source even though they're coming from there. 
So I, I thought I'd cover that before. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> the, the tools that we use to develop this, a lot of work was done using what I call a prototyping environment or development environment called MATLAB. Everybody heard of MATLAB? Yeah. Everybody hating MATLAB? Yeah. Um, what we did there was we made a, a whole series of diffractive modelers. So starting out with guided media and step structures, and we released products about oh, 15 years ago using those. Uh, then moved on to radiating sound into space with objects diffracting it, and then combined the two. So today we can model the transfer function to any point in a field of objects with resonant chambers and all sorts of stuff, uh, and actually work out what the transfer function should be to a point. So what? What's important about that is we also have tools that enable us to optimise shapes of objects that are diffracting. And that's very useful for designing diffractive lenses for the fronts of loudspeakers, for example, or for designing microphones. And it could be useful for designing rooms and acoustics of rooms. Um, there's some stuff we used for doing the demos. I don't think that's important. Uh, and the speakers, we call them Omnipoint ones, these things, made totally in Australia. Yes. Um, tonight's levels, I'm, I'm around 83 dB reference and I can't turn it up any louder. So I hope it's okay for you. And I, I, was, I was hoping that the air conditioning wouldn't do what air conditioning does, be noisy. Source material, we've got a number of source materials tonight. Um, all of this stuff is um, non-commercial. So, sorry, <laughs> can't have copies. We're going to record, we've got recordings that were done at the BMW Edge. Do you know the BMW Edge facility here in Melbourne? Very, very acoustically, amazingly dynamic. <laughs> um, and that's just to make sure we do the right thing in that environment, we did percussion recordings. So you'll hear some of those tonight. And I probably should talk a bit about microphones. Should I talk about microphones? Oh, I'm getting a lot of yes. Um, yes, there are a number of ways to capture distance information. Most of the microphones today will do it because they do have a gradient function. Dipoles, cardioids, omnis don't, but dipoles and cardioids particularly. You can go higher than that with arrays and other uh, devices. In the case of these recordings, these were done with arrays of dipoles and cardioids. The percussion recordings of BMW Edge used point located cardioids that were designed to, if you like, to fire out or listen out <laughs> past what you're recording and listen to the front of it and therefore give you a gradient function between and we had two pairs of those. Then we had symphony recordings at Melbourne Town Hall. They were rehearsals, okay? And that's really good because in the rehearsals you'll hear the conductor yelling at people and that's a very good placement thing because even though the violins are pumping energy everywhere, he isn't. He's just, what do you think you're doing? So you'll hear that. Um, and then there's a thing called skins, which was a, an interesting exercise, which is a string ensemble with water bowls with ice blocks in it. One of these experimental things. Uh, so you can have a listen to that. That was done in Iwaki. And again, it used a sound field. Both of the sound, do you know what the sound field microphone is? Some of you will, some of you won't. Okay. The, a, 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 a guy by the name of Mike Gerzon, uh, 70s, Englishman, was a mathematician and he said, I can create a uniform sound field by having the sum of four particularly shaped lobes. Therefore, I can capture the whole of a sound field by having particularly shaped capture microphones. I can get them into an electrical form, I can shoot them out along four wires, and then I can reproduce them so I can say, well, I'd like to hear what's over there. So I'll just pull out the bits that I need to listen over there, or I'll pull out the bits that I need to listen over there. That device was called the sound field, and originally it was also called the CalRec microphones. Anybody here remember the Cal... I know there's one guy here from England, so he would. Uh, that microphone uh, 
really should get a lot more credit <laughs> for what it achieved. Um, two of these used the Soundfield microphone, but we did a custom decoder for that because we didn't want just pointing microphones at things. We wanted to get gradient functions across them. So what you're going to hear tonight is a whole mix of different things. If you take anything away from this, what you should take away is it does work with existing microphones. I think that's an important thing to know. Um, where we're at with this is we need to go to higher order. The order, zero order is omni, first order is your dipole, we're up to fourth order and looking at fifth order gradient functions. So we're getting directivities of 18 dB, which is pretty good. Um, pretty good? Yeah, I've got a yes. <laughs> okay. I've also got some stuff here, which you'll probably need a seat belt for, which is pop music. Uh, and this is rendered because you don't have to record this, you can also dry render it. In fact, the Wayfield synthesis of Fraunhofer, because they don't have a capture environment, they actually do a lot of hard render. So they'll actually take the sound sources in dry format and then place them and slop them up with a bit of reverb and so on. Not commercial use. Okay. How have we set this up? Well, for the render, the render is the most complex one. We start with dry source. There are three things we have to do to it. The first thing is we've got an array transfer function here, and we've got to get that into the equation. So we have a, an array transfer function convolvement of what the array is. Then we do a distance render, and that is controlling the wavefront curvature to give you the appropriate distance for each sound object you've recorded. Remembering that it doesn't have to be static, it can move, because we can, we can change the wavefront curvature dynamically. And then finally we do what would be your conventional pan render that you do for a stereo uh, mix on a dry source. And then that all goes out to the array. The array driving signals tonight, I'm using four channels. I'm using front left and right and rear surround left and right on a Dolby AC3. If it, if it works on Dolby AC3, it will work on anything. Okay, so what you get though is not all of that. We just, I've stored it all on the, on the disk. So all the processing is pre-processing, it's all stuck on the disk. Okay. Um, note for grumpy listeners. Uh, just listen to it, but be aware that what you're listening for is not quite what you've been used to. It's, it's looking to see whether this is giving you the impression of imagery that is not being buggered up when you move or when you're not in the right location. A key part of this, in the, in the recording of the uh, rehearsal for the orchestra, the conductor is very well placed when he's reproduced. It's very useful to get all of you to point at where he is because you'll point here, and you'll point here, and you'll point here. So I'd be pointing to a point in space. What does that mean in terms of sweet spot? There isn't one. It's gone. Um, but there is an issue, and that issue is humans are used to having a thing where the sound came from. So when a sound comes out of nowhere, they get a bit confused. And in one of the recordings we had, I've told this story, but we had a metronome plus other instruments and the metronome was out the front and it was doing what metronomes do well. And in the reproduction room, the people could move from the reproduction to the recording room. In the reproduction room, there's the metronome. Where is it? Sitting in the middle of midair. And everybody had this problem that they needed something physical where that metronome was. So in the end, I had to put a cardboard box <laughs> on the ground so they said, OK, OK, we can handle it. Interesting, interesting. And a lot of new things about how humans perceive sound could come out of this. OK. I'll, I'll leave that up. Rightio. So what we're going to do, I don't know what the levels are like, but let's give it a go. And I think this one's a, I think this one's a symphony. This is a What is 
interesting is if you come down the front and move past those front arrays, the whole thing collapses. I'll do, I'll, if, if you, you can listen to more of that if you want, but I was going to go on to the percussion. This is a different venue, this is the BMW Edge, very reverberant. I'll try percussion to it. I, this is different instruments with a lot more spectrum in each instrument. We didn't know what the audience was going to be, uh, so this is for the younger crowd. Um, you'll find out why now. That was, that was for the young at heart. Now the, the request was to find the track where the uh, conductor yells at the orchestra. And also the microphone's behind his head. That rehearsal's wonderful for ambience. What's making me nervous is you're all congregating in the sweet spot. <laughs> It's happy, it's bad happy. <laughs> well I think we're supposed to wrap up at nine and we wanted some discussion. So, thank you very much. I, there were a number of items to discuss. Any feedback you've got is always welcome, please do so. The, the issues are with the, the, the technology and the state it's in, is there an opportunity to consider moving beyond surround into the wave formats? The problem you have with the wave field synthesis is it is hu uh, hugely complex. The Fraunhofer people, in conjunction with industry, have put in an installation in Germany which is two and a half thousand loudspeakers and 778 channels, and that's not really domestically compatible, it's not even cinema compatible. Um, so the alternative is to look at these, this approach, probably in future my view would be this will have a place. It will probably be a hybrid, so it may be that there is some uh, additional sources to give you spatial resolution, but the format I believe has a justifiable place in in uh, history, uh, to uh, and the compatibility is there too. So please consider. We have a few opportunities to consider the wave reconstruction approach versus the sweet spot, sweet spot centric sort of systems. Uh, I don't really want to start a them versus us thing going here. Uh, but some of the work here can then go into give benefit to stereo recordings and surround recordings. 
So you can start to emerge from the problem that you've always had a restrictive sweet spot and you've got to slop it up with echo and effects to try and get it bigger. The capture end is an issue. We are working on capture devices, but it's very difficult because it's so expensive to make microphones. The Brule and Kerr guys, if you know them, they've got an array of 64 half-inch microphones. Do you want to know how much that costs? <laughs> no, it's about basketball size. Um, compatibility is a big issue. This is totally compatible. I mean, if we wanted to, we could say, all right, let's render this all back and we just adjust the arrays so that they render to where the stereo speakers are. You could do that. Therefore, but it is compatible. Uh, but one of the advantages is if I can move the sound imagery forward and back and across, then I can leave it there and move the speaker back. So I don't have to have this loudspeaker in a place that's inconvenient. I might as well just move it to the boundary and then render the sound field correctly in the room. That, I believe, will be probably one of the biggest advantages of this because it's got a wonderful Y factor <laughs> and it's also very useful in studios. Having an Omni, you don't have to aim. You just put them in the wall. There aren't many Omnis in fact, there's only two companies I know that are working on that, and one of them is Cabas. Um, so there's that. And what about perceptual issues? You've all heard distance information for objects. Some would have a better effect than others. But you've heard distance information from this and saying, that's forward, that's back. It's staying a bit where it should, moving around a bit. But what that means is you're perceiving distance. And that's not in any of the textbooks, and that's not in any of the perceptual models. I have heard some very, very good online recordings in the 60s and 70s that, that captured the sense of distance. Yeah, they, they did. Did they set out to do that? Probably not. If you now go back in and analyse it, you discover they did get a gradient function in their capture that worked quite well. All right, um, so there's also, therefore, the perceptual engineering side. So we need to look at perceptual aspects. It is no good putting a four inch loudspeaker in front of somebody and doing tests with that because that is anything but an omnidirectional point source. It has got an amplitude and phase profile with angle that is not good on the diameter of a human head. And yet I see so many people sticking these three and four inch loudspeakers in, in test facilities and testing perception. We need point sources. Good, we've got point sources. Well, we're getting better. Then, what about how humans perceive this stuff? We really need to do a lot more work on that. But the only issue I'll mention here in closing is I, people keep saying they want an in-your-face effect. And, and I'm going to do that now because I was just saying we'll capture the field as it was. But I think we really need to demonstrate some off-the-wall, in-your-face type effects with this because then people will buy in. Okay, um, I think thank you. Yes, I think thank you. I would thank you very much for your time. I hope it's been interesting. I hope it's been a journey and you've got somewhere. It's uh, good to see a bit of interest. Thank you. Thank you.